The first thing we need to do in section one is we have what we call the buyer attraction pyramid. This document, the reason it's so powerful is I start with it anytime I have a pricing conversation. And the way that I utilize it is making sure that the seller understands how we get buyers into the home. So as you see there in the middle line, right? When I'm explaining this, when I'm talking to the seller about market value, I go, I go, Anna, you know, looking, first of all, the goal of this is to set an initial asking price so we can get a buyer frenzy in here to drive up the price of your home to set record breaking price per square foot, feet, foots. I'll get that, I don't know why, I think I always say foot, I must say it. Um, in order to do that, we have to understand the psychology of the buyers. If we price your property at or below market value, you can see here that you're gonna get 90, 75% of the interested buyers that are gonna to wanna to come and see that property. Now, the danger is if we go 10% over market value, we're only gonna attract 30% of the buyers. And when we go 15% over market value, we're only gonna get 10% interest in your property. So this is a powerful tool to make sure they understand. Now, when I do this live, I have it printed out and I draw a circle and I go, we don't wanna be up here and we don't wanna be down here. We wanna be right or below market value so we can get into that fat section of this pyramid to get everybody in here. So you're in a position to turn down offers instead of not receiving any offers at all. So when you do this live, this is a, a tool in your tool belt that will come out and we'll talk about when, when we do this, when we do the whole live, like in front of the client, right? We're gonna show you how this looks, but we gotta make sure we understand that tool. Now, the next thing we do is of course, we have to get the public record information. We gotta know everything about the property that we possibly can. And don't forget, we already did our seller profile. That second page asks them all of the other questions. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to make sure that what I know that was recorded with the county and what they told me, is there any discrepancies? I thought the basement was unfinished. This is telling me the basement is finished. I thought it had three car garage, but they told me they had only had two car garage. They also told me that they built a barn or they did this or whatever it is in your area that might be unique. Does it reflect it here? And I'm just trying to make sure I understand all of the data. And then I take my highlighter and I just highlight what you see here listed below because I'm gonna use this to draw attention to it later on if necessary. The power to highlight and draw attention. When you look at a public record report, there's tons of different info on here. And I know people are like, well, that's why I use this other you know, device to do CMAs and all this. I like it to be from the MLS, to be quite honest with you. I like it to look very technical in a lot of ways and very authentic. I think it provides them a more authentic understanding that I'm a pro and this is the information that I have access to. And then I highlight what I wanna draw their attention to. And then please write this down. You have to learn to read upside down. People go, what? You gotta get really comfortable with reading data upside down. And that's why once you get your rhythm down and you know all of your highlights are always the same every time, you look like such a bad mamma jamma when you flip that puppy over and you're able to go, so I just wanna confirm public records is stating that your property is a three bedroom, two bath, 1,790 square feet, built in 1982. It's on a 4,600 square foot lot. It's got da 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 And they just go, wow, this guy or gal is legit. But you only really have to know how to look at six things upside down and get used to doing that rhythm. I can't tell you how many listings I've taken where they go, Brendan, we met with six, seven, eight people. You just by far seem to know the information better than anyone else. And your confidence came through in that. And it's confidence is what wins people's trust, right? That's, that's how we build confidence is that we do something really well over and over and over again. Pro golfers, the piano players, the guitars, they just do simple things at an extremely high level, okay? So next thing we wanna do is obviously we wanna go to where we find out what the seller thinks their home is worth. So now that I have the public record, I can obviously start looking at Zillow, the street view, the aerial view on Google, the one page public record report like as we already have. 
What I'm looking for is I'm trying to find out, especially on the aerial, what does this property back up to? Is there a crack house next to it? Is there, do they back up to a train? Uh, are they three doors down from a Home Depot? All of these things, are there power lines running through the backyard? Are they on a golf course versus does their home back up to the other home? All of these things are going to have a factor, but I have all of this quick data information. So when this is happening in real time, it's a very complete strategy. You're just going, check this, check this, check this, got it, got it, got it, verified the public record, done, done. I know what I'm talking about. Now, as you get ninja level of this, we have all this data up, right? Like if you, if you could see my setup, I have three screens right here. Don't go out and buy three screens, not necessary, right? As you start to evolve all this. But if you're talking to an expired on the phone, I've got all this pulled up in real time. And I'm like, oh, I know where your house is. Oh my gosh, it's that one with the white picket fence. Oh, and it must be so nice that you live, you know, a block away from Super Target. Gosh, that must be very convenient. So I have data happening in real time to pull this up to make sure that I can have very honest conversations about them with what, what's available to me at that moment, okay? Um, so Monique, I'll answer your question. So I always see that there is a bedroom or bathroom that have been added, which adds value to the home, correct? Do we base the price on square foot of the home and not how many rooms? I may be overthinking things. So this is a great question, Monique. As we go through all of this, I think I'm going to answer it as we talk about it because Monique is doing what everyone does naturally is you're trying to figure out pieces of what the house is that adds value to try to get to a very specific number. What I want to do is make sure that we understand that once we have the data, we are creating a pricing position for an initial asking price that's not going to have to matter with all of that information. We're going to take averages, we're going to take aggregate, and we're going to take what is our active competition, right? If I know right now that there's three comparables out there that are actively competing against us, what do we have to be the best overall in class in value pricing and, and, and everything to make sure all the buyers come to us and not the other three? We're going to talk a lot about that. If there are no actives, then we're going to go to the pendings, then we're going to go to the solds, and the data is going to tell us exactly what we should do. If we have six closed comps and the data is telling us that the six closed comps have closed at 250 a square foot in the last six months and the seller goes, yes, but I want 350 a square foot. We're trying to get the understanding to the seller of going, well, if all the other ones closed at 250 a square foot on average, and we agree there's differences on each one, pluses and minuses. This one had a three car garage. You have a two car garage. You put in gold flooring. I know it. It's beautiful. I've never seen gold, gold floors in a house. You're right. It's amazing. But this other one had silver floors. So they all had their different bells and whistles. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, or Mr. and Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, Seller, whoever it is, Seller, Seller, whoever I'm speaking to, what I need you to understand is what we're doing is just sitting an initial asking price to get people to see your beautiful home. But if we're priced so aggressively that no one is going to come look at it because they see that there's four others that are comparable that are available right now, I'll never get them in the house to see your beautiful golden floors. Now, we have to also be very clear that we're evaluating pricing impacts. Now, whatever market you're in, I know we have people all over the country and we have you know, tons of people that are watching these recordings. When, when we look at this, we have to make sure that when we're establishing price, we have to take into factors, right? So let's take in, for example, the house that I'm, uh, our comparable is on a busy street. Uh, if you're on an extremely busy street and you have a property that you're trying to compare it to, what happens with sellers, because Zillow doesn't care about a busy street, Zillow goes, that house, because it's taking all of the neighborhood aggregated data, is going, that house, based on its square footage, lot size, should sell for $600,000. It doesn't take into the factor that there's a highway in, in, on the front door of this. So what we have to do with our sellers is we have to make sure that they're understanding the difference of their property versus an algorithm. And here's how you do this. If you ever have a property that has a unique feature, you're gonna go back in your MLS and you're gonna search, let's take this busy street property. Every property that's sold in the last two years, you might have to go three years back, that is sold on a busy street in that general area, 
establish what the average price per square foot for that property has been, then take all the properties that are three or four streets over that have sold in the same time period, because you got to use the same data scale in a two to three year period, one year, depending on how many comps you need, you're going to want probably six or seven, get an aggregate. And then we can easily explain to the seller properties that were not on a busy road sold for 300 a square foot. Properties that sold on a busy road sold for 250 a square foot. So there's a $50 a square foot difference on average versus homes on a busy street versus homes that are not on a busy street. So you got to bring them down and make them understand this. Same thing if you're in a golf course community or a home that has a beautiful view. Maybe it's the reverse. If your home has a beautiful unobstructed view of the mountains, the beach, the lake, the, the city, whatever, wherever you're at, the farm, when you're looking at the comparables, if properties with an unobstructed view sold for X and properties that back up to another home sold for X, now we can talk to them about the difference in valuation. Because when they bought their lot, they're like, it was a $350,000 lot premium, Brendan. I mean, come on, you don't understand. We go, I get that. I understand that. But we're talking about how the buyers view this and setting a market value price that is going to create a frenzy to get you the highest price possible. That's all we're trying to do. Now, high rises, you got to think about this as well. Here in Denver, the Four Seasons has a high rise residence. The unit that sold on the Western facing that had mountain views sold for 10 million, the penthouse. The one that had city views, and I won't even say city views, views of Aurora, Colorado, which is fine and pretty, but it's not the mountains, sold for 5 million. Same exact unit, $5 million price difference because one had view of the mountains and one had view of a neighborhood. So we got to make sure that we're taking this data into understanding. My favorite is power lines. Sellers all the time. Yeah, I mean, I know we're right next to the power lines and we never really noticed it. It didn't really bother us. And I'm like, yes, but it does bother some. So let's find all the comps that backed up to power lines use that as our, our, our baseline. Okay. So next thing we got to have our aerial map. We got to be making sure that they're clear that we're talking apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. Now, when you're doing comparables, here's my kind of golden rule, three actives, three pendings and six closed. That's what I always shoot for. If that's not available, maybe there's only four closed that makes sense. I don't try to make a closed come into that grouping and try to do all of this. Doing this for years and years and years, I'm always trying to just make sure here's the three that are competing against you, here's what's actively pending right now, and here's what's sold on an average of similar comparable properties in your area. That's all we're trying to do. So don't overthink it. If there's only three closed, there's three closed that make any sense. If you're in a mountain area way out in the middle of the woods and, and nowhere and there's you got to go further out to even find something. What you really want to do is you want to rely more on the actives and go further out and go, if I had $750,000 to spend right now, what's available to me on the active market to spend my $750,000 on in a mountain type property arrangement, right? Then you're going to go and be able to explain that to them and go, based on this, this one's been sitting for X amount of days, not sold yet. This one's been here. There was a closed from a year ago that sold at this. That's how you start to have conversations about this. I want to make sure you always understand how to get the data at the highest level first and to try not to overcomplicate it, right? All we're trying to do is help sellers make an informed decision on how to price their home in order to attract as many buyers as possible. That's the end goal. That's all we're trying to do, okay? Now, Comparable properties, here's some golden rules that I try to utilize if it makes sense. And this works probably 90% of the time, unless of course, as I said, you get into the multi, multi-million dollar price range. You have very bizarre, unique properties. If you're doing farms, you're doing ranches, this, this will change it a little bit. But for most of us that are doing regular market analysis in regular areas, this will work all the time. So I always make my comps sold in the last six months. Why six months? Why do we think six months? That's what an appraiser would use. Thank you, Tanil, because 
The appraiser, if the home is going to be financed, they cannot utilize a comparable from anything further back than six months, right? So sometimes you'll have sellers go, but this home down the street sold a year ago for X. Why aren't you using that comparable? I'll still look at it. I'll keep it in my back pocket, but I'll explain to them because that was a different market. Interest rates have gone to here and an appraiser would not be able to utilize it to compare this property either to get financing for someone that wants to purchase your home, right? So that is a big piece of this, all right? Now, I always have my comps. I wanna make sure that when I'm structuring these and in the order that I'm going to um, deliver them, that we're going through these in a specific order and we're gonna show you how to do that live. And then on my comps, I just have a simple one pager. Now, a lot of you save on your colored ink. I know your MLS has 49 pages of pictures of the house. I don't need all of that for my, my CMA. If, if you think that you're gonna need it, print it, right? But for me, I'm just using a one pager so I can show them similarity of, of construction, build and quality. That's all, that's all we're trying to do. If, if one has wood floors and the other does not, if one has carpet, this one has this, I'm just trying to get a brief overview to make sure that they understand. Now, if I feel that the second and third page is necessary, I'll go ahead and bring those as well. But remember, all we're doing, and, and this sounds weird, is we're kind of building a case. We're just trying to build a case that justifies the verdict we're wanting to get. And we use different pieces of evidence to prove our point, right? That's all we're really trying to do is we're just, we're just trying to win the case. We're gonna provide the evidence and then they're the jury. Hopefully, if we presented the case right, they're gonna go with us. They're gonna understand it. If we didn't do a good job of this, they're gonna acquit, right? So we just gotta make sure that we've gotta have our plan in place to do that.